Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, the last time we were together, we talked about an appetite for listening. And I thought we were going to make that just one talk, but it got in the middle of it. And it's like, let's just break this into two. But let me let me kind of take you back to kind of help you get to where I want to start from today. The idea was when I was a kid, I had a huge appetite. And actually, I still have a huge appetite but for food. But I have learned I have an appetite for more than just food. I have an appetite for uh, all kinds of things, travel and uh, love and also, I am learning the importance of having an appetite for listening. I want to be known as somebody who is a great listener. Stan and I were talking this past week, and we we're talking about how easy it is to kind of get into that mode of talking and forgetting that the most important thing you can do is to listen and to listen with understanding. At The Village, I said this the last time we were together, we don't want to just listen to black voices during Black History Month or LGBT voices only during um, Pride uh, in the summer in Atlanta, but we want to listen to people all the time. We want this community to be known as a community that has an appetite for listening because that is fundamentally an act of love. And you and I know that Jesus said his followers would be known by their love. So it just makes sense that we're going to become great listeners. I love the quote, used it last time, I want to say it again, ta Coates, great, brilliant African-American writer, intellectual, he said this, listening is an act of acceptance, of allowing others to be who they are, and in return, allowing ourselves to be influenced by them, to listen and to be willing to be influenced by the things that we are hearing. There was a time when I felt like my job was to do this, that I knew the better way and I needed to tell everybody the better way. I put that to bed a long, long, long time ago. Now I feel like it is a different thing. I have grown comfortable with questions. I have grown comfortable with knowing I don't have the answers. I have become comfortable with being a truth seeker, but not someone who knows absolute truth. And I know a big part of it is learning to listen, and I want all of us to become great listeners. Now, let's remember a few thoughts we talked about last week, just as a way to highlight. Uh, last time we were together, we talked about having a big appetite for listening. That helps us to develop a greater appreciation for diverse perspectives. Um, I saw a meme uh, this week that just I thought was funny. The meme was a book cover, and the book cover said a beginner's guide to arguing theology on the internet. And uh, the the big bold title said everybody is wrong, but me. And uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of people. That's their whole life is they know the answer, they know the truth, they know, and they've never even considered a different perspective. When we learn to listen. We are exposed to diverse perspectives, and as we listen to diverse perspectives, it will change how we think. That's why we want to listen to all of our friends. We want to listen to them. My single friends have taught me so much, the things that I haven't thought about. I've been, I've been with Jane now for 18 years. I've not thought about a lot of the things that they are thinking about. It helps me understand. My gay friends have taught me things. African-American friends have taught me things. I listen and I am open to being influenced by what they are saying and changing my perspective. The second thing we talked about was when I think about having a big appetite for listening, I begin to see systemic injustices that I might have missed. And uh, that has been so true in my life. Really enough said there, you know, when you listen to people and you trust that they are telling you how they feel, genuinely how they feel, when you trust that, you realize wow, my perspective is not the only perspective, and the way I have been treated in my life is not necessarily the way everybody has been treated. And I am smart enough, I think, to realize that a white cisgendered male, I have probably had preferential treatment most all of my life. It's so natural that I don't even want to admit it. But the truth is, that has been the way it's been. So I think that's a good perspective. Third thought last week we talked about is when I think about having an appetite for listening, it challenges biases that I have. 
I have a friend who told me, I remember the conversation vividly. He told me that he grew up in the mountains and they would see the Atlanta news at nighttime. And it just, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And so when you watch local news, it's going to be, if there's a murder, if there's a rape, if there's a robbery, it's the first thing, right? It's got to keep everybody scared. If it bleeds, it leads. And he said his mom said repeatedly to him, you have to stay away from Atlanta because all of those black folks that are in Atlanta and how dangerous they were. And he said, I'm now a 40-year-old man, and I still know that is a bias deep inside of me. And uh, anyway, I just know that you know, and I know, the world is far more complex than the biases that we were brought up with. And you begin to meet people, and you begin to experience more, and you begin to realize those things that we were taught sometimes as children, was it was just fear, and it was biases that we have to get past. Forethought, again, last week, but an important part. When I think about having an appetite for listening, I realize I have a role to play in helping validate people's experiences. I, I really, that was probably my favorite thought from last week, is the importance when you listen to somebody, it lets you validate that their experience is real. It's genuine. Most people don't get that sense. They feel sometimes invisible or ignored. But when you sit across from them, and you listen, and you validate that experience that they're telling you about, that is a hugely powerful thing. And uh, that's kind of where we tied it up last time we were together. So now I want to take just a few steps out, a few more thoughts, and uh, then I think that will wrap this up, and it'll be a good, a good thing for us to carry with us. Am I being a great listener? Do I have an appetite for listening? But when I think about having an appetite for listening, another thought that is huge is when I do that, it helps me build connections. It helps me put pieces together in life that, that's going to be richer and going to be more wonderful than maybe I would have ever known not having it together. I'm so happy and proud that the village includes such a diverse group of people working on becoming better versions of ourselves. And by listening to each other, we build bridges, and we see how, though we're all different, we, we are different, different. We also hold a lot of things in common, and I don't want to ever forget that. When you talk about different types of individuals and you use that kind of distinction, we need to make sure that we never forget the idea is we are also one, that that connection is real. And we need to make sure that that comes out. When we start to realize that our differences are beautiful, they are. We face struggles, and some of those struggles might be unique, but they also bind us together. And that's an important thing to realize. We have a sense of solidarity that helps us all survive a little better together than we will survive on our own. I've read a couple of interesting books over the last few weeks uh, one of the books that I read is called The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time, and it's by Yasha Monk, and he's a German-American political scientist and author, and it is a very, very interesting book. The book looks at how focusing on a person's group identity is important, very important, but there are also some pitfalls if you if you stop there. And sometimes by focusing only on the differences, you lose the connectivity. And it's done in a very scientific way. It's very, very, uh, it, it talks about some of the things that we are falling into in our culture and our attempt to be more equitable and our attempt to be uh, more for equality, but also for equity, how we can fall into traps that can actually divide us in ways that's not healthy. The identity trap questions if focusing on identity really brings everybody together, or if sometimes it keeps us apart. At the end of the book, he suggests a way forward, and it's understanding that identity is more complex maybe than we first understood it, and we need to go dive deep into it, but we also need to hold out. We are connected together. We're connected together. I love the scripture from Galatians where Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, 
There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. We are all one in Christ. And I think that what that means is, remember the main thing. We are all a part of this human family. Let's learn from each other, but let's not forget that. I think the goal is to listen to people, discover their stories, help fight for equality and equity, but also make central the idea that we're part of the human family and we're together. And we've got to learn how to do it together. I think the young freshman senator from Illinois was trying to convey that idea way back in 2004 when he stood before a national convention and he stood before all of us watching on television around the world. And he said, and you'll remember this, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is a United States of America. And I think what he is saying is, Yes, you think different things, but can we not find that way to be united? I love that. We need to connect with each other and learn from each other. So that's an important thing. Another important benefit of listening is this. When I think about having an appetite for listening and I have that appetite, I recognize the necessity for promoting social justice, making life as good as it can be and fair for people. That's that whole equality, but more than equality, equity. How can we help? make this life a fairer life for people. Walter Brueggemann is one of my heroes. He is an American Protestant Old Testament scholar, the most influential Old Testament scholar alive today, Walter Brueggemann. In his book, The Prophetic Imagination, he says that we think the prophet was foretelling or uh, almost like just uh, trying to to say this is how it's going to be out there. But really, he was saying, have this imagination. This is what life could be like. And he was presenting this idea of a better way. You know, the scripture uh, turning their swords into pruning shears. That idea is, yes, we have swords and yes, they're used to kill. But in God's desired future, can you not imagine that we would use that metal not for swords to kill, but we would use that metal to make garden tools, farming equipment, so the land could be tilled and vegetables and produce could grow and people could be fed. Isn't it a more beautiful picture to work towards that? Uh, A couple of weeks ago, Jane and I went up to Philadelphia to be a part of a a wonderful, wonderful service in an Episcopal church with our friend Shane Claiborne where they took guns that had been donated and cut up and they melted them down to create little shovels and little uh, pruning shears and little tools that can be used in the garden, taking something that was created as an instrument of death and using it for something better. That's that idea of prophetic imagination, prophetic imagination. And uh, as I think about listening, that's what comes out to me. I need to I need to think about social justice and how I can fight for a better world for everybody. We say all the time, vote the common good, vote the common good, vote the common good. I have friends who tell me I'm voting this party because this helps my tax bracket. The end. Well, I get it. I get it. I think you ought to consider your own interest as you think about who you're voting for, but not in isolation from voting the common good, what what is most helpful to people who are poor? What is most helpful to people, LGBT, our LGBT brothers and sisters and siblings? What What's most helpful to our Hispanic friends? What is most helpful to those people who have been persecuted and trying to get to our country for help? What is the more helpful way to think about voting the common good? And I think listening has been able to be a huge part of helping me. And uh, that leads me to the last point, and I appreciate you staying with me. And I believe you have an appetite for listening, or you wouldn't have stayed with me through all of this. You just have to make sure that you listen to a diverse group of people. And uh, my final point is this. When I think about having that appetite for listening, I think about the importance of creating safe spaces where minority voices feel safe enough to share the truth of their life. It, It is crazy to me. I've spent probably 28 of the 30 years that I have pastored the village being the primary speaker every single week at our at our church. And 
it it wasn't I, I I didn't know a lot of people most of those years that that were kind of where we were and how we understood inclusion and how we understood a lot of this walk but I didn't understand the importance of giving people a chance to share their story and it's only been the last couple of years that that has become super more important to me and I'm learning we need to create a space where people can share and we need to honor them we need to listen to them we need to uh, respect them I recently read another book that I think I would have highly recommend it. I think you would love it. It's called Our Hidden Conversations, What America Really Thinks About Race and Identity. And it's by the NPR personality, Michelle Norris. Excellent, excellent book. What she did is she created space for people online to say honestly what they felt about race. And then as the book developed, she was able to go deeper with some of the people to to give them a platform to really talk about their their deeper thoughts. And it's beautifully done, and of course she's, she's lovely in how she presents it, and I would recommend it to you. The book delves into the complex and often unspoken thoughts that so many people have about race, and uh, I, I would highly recommend it. It's an interesting, interesting book, and it let me know that we're doing a good thing by creating space for people, not to judge people when they talk about their feelings, and what they're thinking. At The Village, we learned a long time ago, it's not just enough to say everybody is welcome here. We say that's not enough. We want everybody to know and feel that they matter here, that we want to hear their story. It's important for us to hear their story. We want to grow in empathy. We want to celebrate each person. You're not valued at The Village because you show up on Sunday mornings. You're valued just because you're you. You're not valued at the village because you give an offering or you volunteer your time. We appreciate those things. That's just helpful, very helpful. But you are valued because you are you. And we listen because you are you. That's the important thing. In 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. preached a sermon he called A Time to Break Silence. Dr. King said this, a time comes when silence is betrayal. The sermon was about his opposition to the war in Vietnam, but his words, as is often the case, ring true as it relates to other topics as well. Dr. King went on to talk in that message about the importance of not only listening to people we agree with, but to also listen to what people who oppose us have to say as well. He said, here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence when it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of us. For from his view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. What a wise, wise person saying that a long time ago. You don't hear that often. He continued, it's this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. Again, when you listen to someone, you can see them as they tell their story. And often, often even as they're talking, you can see them begin to change as they now see that you're willing to listen to them. It is this type of understanding that will transform the deep gloom, King says, of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men and women. Listening is an act of love. I can't say it any other way. Listening is an act of love. We need to learn to talk less and to listen more. And I hope over these last weeks at the Village, in our live services, but also online as we have had these times together, I hope you understand that's what we are trying to model, the importance of being great listeners. I think that is a key part of following Jesus. And uh, I hope that that resonates with you. Would you pray with me? Gracious and listening God, we come before you today with hearts open to your words and open to your spirit, and we really want to be eager to listen. 
In the stillness of our souls, we seek the gentle whisper of your voice guiding us, teaching us, and drawing us close to your heart. Lord, as we reflect on the virtue of listening as followers of Jesus, we ask for the grace to be attentive not only to your voice, but also to the voices of those people around us. Teach us to listen with compassion, patience. Help us recognize your presence in every encounter we have. Help us cultivate a spirit of humility that listens before speaking, that seeks to understand before being understood, and that loves without expecting anything in return. May our listening be an act of love and a testament of our desire to follow Christ in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.